So hi, I'm Paula Judith, and I am so happy to introduce career historian Annie R. McEwen, who has lived in Spain, France, the UK, and Morocco. Oh, how exciting. Her background helps her create award-winning romance set in faraway places and in faraway times. She is the winner of the 2002 Page Turner Award, which uh, that was in the romance category. She also garnered the ni uh, 1922, ha the, <laughs> 2000, <laughs> the 2022 RTA, or excuse me, that's RTTA, which is a romance through history, romance through ages Age award yeah. <laughs> anyway from the romance writers of america uh in the post-victorian world war one category a second place in 2022 rtta in the georgian victorian category and multiple honorable mentions and or publications on platforms like globe soup readsy and others her short fiction appears in the anthology Love Wins 2021 for Ukrainian Relief and two RWA Hearts Through History anthologies, The Eve of Love 1922 and The Light of Love October of 1923 publication date. Be sure to uh, advertise or not advertise, but promote that on uh, the group website, the Facebook group. <laughs> Annie's work in progress, excuse me. Annie's work in progress is a novel of smuggling and romance in which her third great grandfather, a fourth light dragoon, makes a cameo appearance set on the Kentish coast in 1749. Oh, that's wonderful to have that history of your family. In her working file are um, a Regency era novel about a reluctant bridegroom and sequels to her Victorian working class romance, The Corset Girl. Oh, that's a good one, too. When not in her 1920s bungalow in Florida, Annie lives, researches, and writes in Wales. Very <laughs> exciting. You are represented, Annie is represented by the Blue Ridge Literary Agency. All right, welcome, Annie. How are you? I'm okay, and thank you for having me here. So I know that we have um, an exciting presentation from you tonight, um, and I didn't know if you wanted to uh, screen share for that or if you want me to fumble around I, with the slides. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to fumble. Let's fumble here and see if we can get it. And there we are. Uh, let's go to the beginning. Okay, not too bad. I remember in the early days, because as um, you know, Paula keeps trying to place me in 1922. And I, <laughs> as, as an historian, I really, I actually really enjoyed that. You know, it's one of my favorite years, <laughs> 1922. But, um, <laughs> I, I sometimes feel like that's where I'm from when I think about the early, I don't know if any of you were around in the early uh, years of PowerPoint. Do you remember the dreaded PowerPoint moment <laughs> in which none of us could get the slides to operate? And I stood either been in or stood in front of multiple classrooms <laughs> and, and spent, all sorts of time trying to get the technology to function, you know, while, while my students look at their, uh, well, in, the, in that time, they were looking at their wristwatches. Now they're looking at their cell phones, uh, hoping that the tech technology is just going to eat up most of their class period, and then they can leave without actually having had to learn anything. But um, I'm here today to, I hope, give you some, helpful temp tips and insights into researching historical romance. Um, and so why don't I just try to get started here? Yes. All right, historical fiction versus historical romance. Yeah, this is, um, you know, the story about the all um, 
all turkeys are birds, but not all birds are turkeys. You know that one? Well, if we apply that to historical romance, I'm going to say it's a turducken. <laughs> <laughs> because it, you, the thing about historical romance, in my opinion, is that it is harder to write. It is more challenging for the author than either historical fiction or romance. The reason, of course, is pretty obvious if, if anybody's written it or made a stab at writing it. Um, you have to preserve all the elements of romance. You can't just step away at any time from any of them. So you are writing a fully articulated romance at the same time that you are writing fully articulated historical fiction. If you cut corners in either of those, you're gonna be in trouble. Either your romance art and your romance elements are not going to be developed um, you know, as well as they could be because you've erred on the side of just getting all tangled up in the, in the historical fiction, or you're going to, uh, and, and we've all seen this too, you're going to weight the romance so heavily that you look at the history aspect of it and go, I don't know, you know, is wearing a pair of drawers enough <laughs> of a historical touch for an entire novel? Um, so I, I honestly congratulate anyone that attempts this tur turducken um, because it is a hybrid in the truest sense of the word. Um, and hybrids, as we know, have a wide range of um, effectiveness. And so what I hope in my small little way with this slideshow is maybe to give you some tools that will keep you on the high end of that. Now, the six elements of historical fiction obviously are or maybe not obviously, but I believe they apply equally to historical romance. In fact, they apply equally to any novel that you're writing. Now, when you ask somebody or you get on you know, um, the internet and look for elements of historical fiction or elements of fiction or elements of a novel, you're gonna come up with about the same list. I mean, some lists have five things, some have six. I've seen a couple that have seven. My list has six. And these are character, dialogue, setting, theme, plot, and world building. And what I'm going to do with this little slideshow is show you how each of those must be handled differently and can be handled differently in historical romance. Character. Oh, isn't she? Well, let me introduce you to Marion Makedance. Now, Paula knows, uh, and, and a lot of people on her Facebook page know, because she spilled the beans, <laughs> let the cat out of the bag. Uh, like Paula, I've spent many years doing living history, both in museum settings and um, in historical sites actually in all the countries in which I've lived. But um, one of the characters that I've developed is um, an 11th century um, Anglo-Saxon woman living in the West of England. And so this is Marian Makedance. Now, the reason that I dragged her in here and distracting her from her wonderful drop spindle work asking you not to look too closely at the yarn that she's created that way because it doesn't stand close scrutiny. But when a living historian develops a character, they go through the same stages that a novelist goes through. And I'm a great believer in asking questions. I, I think this is an opinion, but I think 
there's not enough time spent in inquiry before we launch ourselves into um, writing um, or into any task, actually. And there are a lot of reasons for that. One of the most obvious is that if we're writers, we're creative people, right? We have those creative drives that tell us, right, 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 right. You need to sit down and write, right, right. It's hard to still that voice. But I honestly believe that for every page you write, you need to read 100. That's the inquiry. You need to read 100 pages that will give you the underpinning for your character. These will be primary sources and they will be secondary sources. Now, the farther back in history you set your character, the fewer primary sources you are going to find. And if you are writing about people living in a region that was pre-literate or had a strong oral as opposed to a uh, written tradition, you will find essentially no primary sources. That's tough <laughs> because then you're relying on secondary sources. What's the difference between a primary and a secondary source? Primary source is something coming from the mouth of people living in the region and era in which your character is living. So if I'm developing Marion Makedance, I've decided to ask her to put aside her drop spindle and be a character in my novel. I have to find things that were written in her time period in the 11th century. Oh, right away, I'm gonna run into an issue. This is where those 100 pages are gonna save my turducken. <laughs> Women were, seldom literate, and the few women who were literate were in the upper class, in the upper classes. But Marianne, as we can tell from looking at her, <laughs> is not a fine lady. She don't live in the manor house, all right? She lives on a small holding somewhere, maybe she and her husband are tenant farmers in on some, you know, estate. And um, so Marion probably didn't write to us about her life as a common person. In fact, nobody <laughs> from those classes wrote about their lives. So again, we're relying on um, not a secondary source, still a primary source but we're relying on things that were written by um, clerics, for example, because members of the church were often literate. And I, I've done a lot of research on the history of um, convents and um, religious houses starting far earlier than Marion's era. But one of the things that I learned pretty quickly in that research is that um, large convents, large religious houses, often supported themselves from uh, agriculture. They were forbidden by doctrine to generate a profit. And that was pretty much ignored. <laughs> and they sometimes generated enormous profits from sheep, for example, who were sheared and produced the wool that uh, Marion is using to make yarn with her drop spindle. Well, in order to justify their, their um, expenditures every year, the abbess had to keep very close records. And being chatty by and large, they talked about lots of things in those records. 
besides just the number of sheep they had and how many they sheared and how much profit they made from that. And so we may learn about Marion's life and the lives of people like her from reading those records, but those are still primary sources. We will supplement primary sources more or less heavily depending on how many primary sources we've been able to get our hands on by secondary sources. These are the, um, the writings of people who have studied that era. And as you know, scholars can sometimes study very minute things and those might just be the minute things that we need to learn about. Disease, for example, you know, what did these people die of? What was their nutrition like? What was their infant mortality? What was their average lifespan? Um, what diseases did they not have that people living in subsequent eras acquired from contact with people out of their region? Marion probably never went more than a mile from where she was born in her whole life. But as time went on, people traveled further and farther and they had, um, they had access to foreigners. And that was a mixed blessing because sometimes those foreigners brought foreign diseases that they had no resistance to. So epidemiologists and medical historians have studied this sort of thing. And if you decide, well, I need to know you know, how many women died in childbirth, there will be a scholar who's come up with a plausible statistic that you can use. So that's a secondary source. And all of these things come together to answer the questions that we ask our character in our head. Okay. Dialogue. Dialogue is people talking, right? The dialogue in historical fiction is a fabulous tool for us, a fabulous tool. And I'm not going to insult the ethnicities of the, the two people I've quoted here, but um, I'd love it if you take a minute now to just read these. These two excerpts are both from novels that I've written. The first one is from The Corset Girl. Um, so Paula, who is my fabulous ramp mentor will recognize this. Um, and this is a young man. He is my male main character in the novel, Michael Kelly, who goes by Kel. And even though he uh, was born in a slum in Whitechapel at the worst period for Whitechapel, very rough district, very lower class. And even though he had a gang, a street gang career, he's, he's reformed. So he's a reformed bad boy. But periodically he slips back into the language of his youth. And so that's what he's done in that first bit of dialogue. In the second bit of dialogue, um, and I'm indebted to my Italian grandfather for the second bit partially because he um, actually came to America in 1898 as a, as a young kid, teenager, young teenager working um, on a tramp steamer. He was in, in the US uh, until he died um, at the age of 87 and he never really learned to speak English very well. So uh, his sentences typically were a mixture of Italian and English. And what you see here is uh, a little bit of dialogue from a novel I wrote set in uh, 1910 in Ybor City, the immigrant enclave in Tampa, Florida, um, featuring a detective, Jack Scolara, who is himself Italian, but he's, and a very educated man, but he's pretending to be a just off the boat immigrant. 
And so he's using this mixture of Italian and English and, you know, throwing a little Italian profanity in there. So what this does in, in your um, historical romance or in historical fiction generally is that it has an affective quality. When you have to read words that are unusual to you, your brain will try to pronounce them. And so if you've encountered someone who speaks, say with an East London accent, or if you've watched numerable episodes of the East Enders, <laughs> you, your brain will approximate what you've heard. But even if you've never heard that accent, when your brain is forced to phoneticize, to sound out these strange words, you are actually creating part of the historical environment. So you have to, you have, you have to sort of walk a narrow path there between making dialogue like this impossible to read and impossible to understand. You don't want to make it so heavy that people just struggle with it and they say, I, I don't understand this, you know? And I have read novels like that where it was just laid on so thick that it was impossible to wade through it. The other thing you want to be aware of, that's on the other side of this narrow path, is burlesquing the accent. In other words, mocking it. This, this really is a, requires a judgment call on the novelist's part. This is why we have sensitivity readers. This is why we have editors. Um, my usual MO on that is that if it feels too heavy, even if my beta readers are telling me they're not having a problem with it, if it to me feels like I'm laying it on too thick, I back off. I go through and I anglicize it. You know, I just strip it of a little bit of the um, ethnicity or class attributes uh, because it should add to the historical environment, but not at the expense of dignity. All right, so it's a fine line. Setting, here's a little freebie for you. On the left, that map is a Sanborn fire insurance map. <laughs> And if you've never made the acquaintance of the Sanborn Fire Insurance Company, let me introduce them to you now. They provided fire insurance in America from the 1860s right up through the 19, oh gee, I don't even know when they stopped providing fire insurance, at least 1950s, 60s, I'd say. They made fabulous detailed maps of the places they insured street by street, building by building. So for example, when I was writing Café con Sangre, I had to find out what Tampa, where the police department was located, and Ybor City actually looked like in 1910. Obviously they didn't look anything like they look like now. And um, I found, and when you look at these maps and you can buy them, some of them you can download. They're in the Library of Congress and some other places. So you can just download them for free, but you can also buy them. You can even buy print copies of them, which is a wonderful way to spend an evening with these things spread out on a table and learning about the place where your novel is set block by block. I needed to know, for example, in Café con Sangre, because the police, uh, the police department 
then was not where it is now. I needed to know not only what street it was on, I needed to know where the front door and the back door doors were. I needed to know where the police wagons were kept. They obviously weren't kept inside the building, so where were they kept? You have to know things like that, and maps like this are fabulous. Now, the excerpt that I've given you here is from one of my favorite authors, Anne Perry. She doesn't uh, write romance per se, though she often has a romantic element in her book. She writes historical fiction in very high quality. But let us together read this wonderful paragraph. She's describing the fish market in Billingsgate in London. And this is in the 1890s. It was so narrow that the houses on either side reared up like cliff walls. The advertisement boards for fresh ice actually stretching across from one side to the other. Along both sides were stretched mountains of fresh, wet, slithering fish of every description, tiled on benches, and behind them stood the salesmen crying their wares, white aprons gleaming like the fish bellies and white hats pale against the dark stones behind them. Going from that setting, there's something missing. That would be fine, just like it is. You can see Billingsgate, can you not? You can see it. But what are we missing? The smell. So I'm going to give you, if I can, I have to swap glasses here and see if I can give you just a little bit about two paragraphs later. The smell was overpowering. Red herrings, every kind of white fish from sprats to turbot, lobsters, whelks, and overall a salty, seaweedy odor as if one were actually on a beach. It brought back a sudden jolt of childhood excursions to the sea. So when you're writing setting, for heaven's sake, don't forget smell, because it's affective, it produces an emotional response in us, and it's an important part of your selling. Theme. Don't confuse theme with plot, okay? Theme, I like to define as conflict plus action. Now, I'm a big fan of D.H. Lawrence. D.H. Lawrence, I think, did one of the best jobs in the history of literature in portraying theme. Now, I'm showing you a still from the recent film, you know, TV series, BBC series on Lady Chatterley's Lo Lover, which I thought overall was well done. But, uh, and I'm making a gross oversimplification when I say that the theme is neglect produces betrayal. It's one of a number of themes. But you can't, theme doesn't consist just of conflict, nor does it consist just of action. It consists of conflict driven action. And so when you look at your manuscript, you ask yourself, I mean, we're all doing the GMCs, right? Mm -hmm. Goal, motivation, conflict, fundamental to romance. But you gotta look at that conflict and say, yeah, but so what? You know, you can be conflicted out the wazoo and not do anything about it. It's when you've done something about it that creates your theme. And so in Lady Chatterley's Lover, it is neglect, neglect of a woman, a very complex woman who is um, marginalized by her husband 
and seen simply as an object to produce an heir and um, his neglect produces betrayal. In spite of the fact that he has given her permission because he's come back from World War I so damaged physically that he cannot um, produce a child. So he's given her permission to lie with another man. What he does not foresee is that his betrayal, uh, is, sorry, is that his neglect is emotional rather than physical. And so her betrayal is driven by her need for emotional support. And at that point, it becomes very messy and very ugly. And that's your theme. Plot. Well, the plot is simply the acting out of theme. Now, I say simply, <laughs> plots can be simple and straightforward, or they can be incredibly complicated. You could say that the plot is the series of events that lead through that action that was motivated by conflict. So this is its acting out. It can produce a marriage. It can produce, in the case of Lady Chatterley's lover, adultery. It can produce a chalk line around where the body fell, all right? It can produce just about anything, but it has to act out the theme. So when you're looking at the series of events in your historical romance, how is history affecting your plot? It affects it in the same way that it affects your theme. There are certain plots you simply could not have in certain eras and other plots you could. Sometimes existing um, issues within an era will suggest a plot. You might say, well, I wanna write something to do with um, the suffragettes. So you study you know, their, their, um, their history and the events that went on uh, and you determine then um, a plot involving suffragettes, okay? You might or might not be able to take that plot and transpose it into another era, but by studying the currents, the political and other currents, social, cultural currents around um, your particular plot, that's producing not just fiction, not just romance, but historical romance. And so now there are people who violate this. That's up to you if you choose to do it. There are people who purposefully vi violate this. Um, I'm gonna bring up Bridgerton without any judgment here. But Bridgerton is um, is a, a novel, and now, of course, you know, a wildly successful um, filmed version. Bridgerton is something it is a story that has inserted historically anachronistic elements in order to drive the plot. That's up to you if you choose to do that. I I can't talk to that, but um, I think it's a good idea if you choose to do that, that you're aware that you're doing. In other words, are you doing it consciously? Are you doing it mindfully? Definitely, Julia Quinn was doing it mindfully. This was a deliberate insertion of contemporary um, values and agendas into the past where they probably did not exist or arguably did not exist? Or are you doing it because you haven't studied the era enough to know that you're inserting an attitude that just couldn't, you just was not 
wasn't there. Um, but that's a decision you as a writer have to make. And, and I think as long as any decision is made consciously, then it is the right decision, okay? I'm just here to hopefully help you keep from doing it accidentally. <laughs> oh, don't you love this cover art? <laughs> And the golden age of romance cover art of the very famous and must, much missed Robert McGuire, who produced scores of these covers. And, um, and I just love them. <laughs> world building. Okay. World building is what happens when all the other six elements are put together. To the extent that you are able to keep the same degree of historical authenticity in each of the six elements, you will have the strongest world. If, you're, if five of the six are all historically grounded and then your dialogue is contemporary, and you're, you're not doing it consciously, you're doing it because you just haven't mastered the period dialogue, or you don't even know what the period dialogue is, then, then your world may be a little weaker. So that's my argument is that you try to get all six of the elements up to the same level of authenticity and that produces the strongest possible world. When you read books by, um, well, Anne Perry, but in romance, um, Joanna Byrne, especially the Spy Master series, I don't know if any of you have read that, but it is phenomenal. And in the Spy Master series, all of the books, I think there are nine of them, take place during the Napoleonic Wars. The research is deep, 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 deep. And the books are, in my opinion, just immaculately constructed so that each of her elements achieves the same level of authenticity. And when you read them, you lose yourself, just you lose yourself into that world in every way, in dress, in language, in manners, in attitudes, in ethnicity, in, in the politics, the warfare, the animals, the agriculture, the, just the medicine. You're completely taken away. That to me is, that's like a thing to shoot for. All right, where were we? Let's get back. Historical facts are often flagged by well-read or history buff readers. It always makes me wince in a book when I read a detail I know is wrong. And that's Rachel Ray Cobb in a pro-writing aid interview. Um, and, and to me, this, uh, this next quote is, this is a humdinger. Uh, this is from Harlequin, Harlequin Historical Romances, and this is in their guidelines for historical romance. Ensure what you're writing is historically accurate and grounded in research so that readers can be swept along in the beautiful historical world you've created. That I could have just not made this PowerPoint and just given you that one quote because that's it. That's the whole enchilada right there. That's what all the trouble that you take is for because the biggest publisher of romance in the world is telling you right there why you need to do all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Why your turducken needs to have all its feathers on it. Okay, so that's why bother. And here's how, in a nutshell, plan ahead, take notes and record your sources, cross-reference, 
because you will get differences between sources. Spot agendas. This is very important. And this is where people that are new to this kind of research often run into difficulties. I would love to say that every scholar is neutral, <laughs> but I can't say that. <laughs> so, you know, learn to spot when a, when a source has agendas. It could be a primary source. It's loaded with agendas, as has often been pointed out. You know, what we know about um, um, various social groups uh, depends on who, who was the dominant group at that particular time. They're not going to say anything good about groups that they consider less valuable than they. And so that's an agenda right there. Um, fill in gaps plausibly. If you're going to fill in a gap when you absolutely have done due diligence and you can't find any answer to a particular question, then if you have to fill it in, do it plausibly. Don't suddenly bring a helicopter into a Victorian novel. You know, I mean, that's ridiculous. But I have seen some highly implausible projections in, in historical fiction and in romance. Uh, use both primary and secondary sources, not just one. Keep on researching right to the very end, right to the very end. Just pull the manuscript out of your agent's hand and say, wait, wait, I found something that is wrong in there, or I, I, I want to add something in there. Keep researching as long as you have the option to edit that manuscript. Keep researching. Don't give up just because you got to the end and you wrote, you know, Fini. Um, don't stop. Just keep on doing the research. Who knows? Maybe you'll write a sequel. So nothing is ever wasted. Um, and so now we are at the end. And this is Annie at the Jane Austen Fest in Mount Dora, Florida, where I teach a very well attended, completely crazy class called The Unkindest Cut of All, The Art of the Regency Insult. Oh, that would be fun. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, I'm, we're going into our third year for that class. It's the only repeating class at the Jane Austen Fest. It's huge fun. So if you feel like, um, you know, leaving, if you're in a cold climate and you want to go to warm Florida in February, the Jane Austen Fest in a tiny, precious little town called Mount Dora is three days of Austen mania. So um, be good to your inner Janeite. And do visit my, my Facebook page and my website. And um, I'm, I'm trying to be better about posting on Insta. Um, Why don't you open am, that up for questions? Yes, questions, have at it. I'm gonna actually stop the sharing unless somebody wants to go back to an earlier slide, I'm gonna. Stop sharing so we can get um, there. Hello. Hello. Um, I had a quick question about what to do regarding, I mean, I, I, I have taken to adding author notes in the back of my books to kind of reinforce where some of the issues that I've uh, researched for a book, um, I want to document some of those things in author notes to make sure uh, to alleviate uh, what I call the Tiffany problem, um, you know, that where a uh, reader believes something to be true that isn't true. And I just wondered if you had any other um, suggestions for what an author can do to mitigate some of those misconstrued ideas that people have, um, you know, that they think something is true or not true and and you have, kind of have to overcome their, their um, incorrect assumptions or beliefs. Yeah. Um, I'm a huge fan of the author's note. And um, I, I think 
It can be excessive. I mean, I know that I love them partly because I'm an academic and, you know, we never saw a footnote we didn't love. <laughs> and we love appendices and <laughs> author's notes and <laughs> prefaces. <laughs> you know, we love all of that stuff. But um, I think readers like it too, especially if you bring up something that might be confusing or about which they have misconceptions. I, Eloisa uh, James uh, writes a heck of an author's note and um, she has the gift of making her author's notes concise so that they never run beyond a couple, three pages. Right. But they're always fascinating. I, I even put author's notes after short fiction um, you know, because um, I, uh, the story that I have in The Cinder Wench, for example, um, all centers around toy theater. And today, most people don't know what toy theater was. And so I had to explain that briefly. Um, I think you can go on too long. I think um, Diana Gabaldon and Outlander, I mean, her afterwards. <laughs> It's like they're a whole new another book. It's like we have we have the nonfiction book at the end of the fiction book, and it can go on for like twenty pages, you know, thirty. I don't know. Um, of course, her novels are very long. Um, the last one I think was longer than War and Peace. <laughs> Just too long. But um, I love Diana Gabble. But yes, you know. That you can do it that way. The other thing is that you can explain sneakily, and I love to be sneaky, in, in the text. Oh, well, let me think of an example. Um, er, if people assume, oh, I'm, I've got an example right on the tip of my tongue and now it's slid away, but, um, if you're in an historic, oh, here we go, Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard has changed locations three times in the history of London. And so you, you might wanna point out, depending on where your novel is situated um, in the Corset Girl, it's actually situated right after New Scotland Yard opened, which confusingly is not today's <laughs> Scotland Yard. I guess today's, as Doctor Who would say, it's the new New Scotland Yard. But New Scotland Yard uh, opened in, um, oh Lord, who's going to ask me this? 18, I think 1890 or 1891, one of those two years. And so I actually have a character. Uh, justifying the expenditure to build New Scotland Yard. And in the course of justifying it, he mentions where the old Scotland Yard was. And so uh, that's one way, if you can sneak it in, I always think it's better to sneak. But I also think you have to be wary about going on and on that way. I read a novel recently in which um, the one of the main characters totally dropped out of showing into telling for like five or six sentences explaining something and then there and that 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 didn't work real well wasn't a fatal flaw. I mean, you know, you just read it and move on. But I think there's got to be a better way. You know, I strive, I strive for better ways than just dropping totally into telling and explaining. Uh, well, this used to be here, but it's not here now. You know, questions. <laughs> Any other questions now that I've eaten up all that? <laughs> no, I'm, I don't have a question, but I. I do have to say it really irritates me when I'm into a story and something that is a very easy thing to research is just blatantly like, what, don't you understand how these things work? I mean, you know that I shot black powder for 20 some odd years 
And I, I know the size of these pistols is, you know, most of them are huge. And uh, I can't tell you how disappointing it is for me to be in a story and then have this woman decide that she's going to stick this flintlock pistol into her pocket <laughs> as she's going down uh, in the carriage just in case somebody wants to, you know, a, a, a highwayman stops her. And it's like, really, you're going to dig that out of your pocket and expect it to shoot without repriming the, fris the frizzin. <laughs> <laughs> just I don't see that happening, but it it works in the book. <laughs> and, well, and she wouldn't have a pocket either. Well, no, no. I mean, I've seen the pocket, the, the pockets that were tied on over the skirt, or you know, under the skirt, or under the skirt with a hole in the side of the skirt to get there. Yeah, yeah. We we you and I had the conversation about uh, pant pantaloons, bloomers, knickers. Right. Split drawers is the period correct term for them. Split drawers were were what uh, women wore as an undergarment throughout. Um, actually, bloomers were considered any sort of garment like that was uh, hard to believe, but it was considered um, risque. Decent women did not wear them in the Regency era. So in the Georgian and Regency era, they would have had nothing at all under their petticoats. <laughs> Which is much less risque. <laughs> yeah, well, they were commando. <laughs> commando, yes, that's fine. But when drawers came in, which they did from France, oh, well, see, there you go. I mean, a lot of it was the assignment of a moral quality depending on the origin. Now that's a nice piece of um, historical, uh, I won't even call it trivial because it's not. I mean, there's a case where the time period determines attitudes. If you don't know that France and England were at war back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and that there were long periods of time when anything French was unacceptable in England, then you would not understand why drawers would be appalling culturally. Yeah. But um, but when they did come in, they were split drawers. They were on a drawstring. I actually own, I collect vintage and antique clothing and I own several pairs, have worn them. And they have, um, they have a string at the waist and then they're split. They have a, an edge hemmed placket that goes from front to back. Incredibly convenient because you're wearing up to 20 pounds of petticoats and skirt. If you have to tinkle, it's like your nerves. I, you know. I just always thought it was like really disgusting <laughs> to think about going to the bathroom through your underwear. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, that's the whole point is that you wouldn't have to, though you do have to negotiate. Some. Well, and, and a Victorian woman would think the brassiere, for example, is a torture device that they would they would just think that was the most appalling, horrible thing. I love that scene in the film version of Outlander early on when um, Claire Beecham is um, comes to the is taken to the castle, she's traveled back in time. And uh, the housekeeper is undressing her. And she, when she strips, now she's come from the 1940s. So when Claire takes off her dress, she's got a little 1940s flimsy, you know, bra on. And the woman goes, what kind of stays and style you're wearing? <laughs> and Claire's response is, it's called a brassiere. It's French. And the Scott woman goes, oh, oh, my. <laughs> so the enmity against the French was well established in the 18th century. And so that's the only reason that scene makes sense, you know, and, and yet it's a great way to bring in the difference in undergarments. I mean, in romance, you have all these people hopping from bed to bed, and yet it, 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 it's amazing. I know in the romance from the old days, you never, when I say the old days, I mean like <laughs> when I, in, my, in my 20s, <laughs> uh, you never read about underclothing. I mean, it just, it just 
were was everybody not wearing it? I mean, it just <laughs> never entered. And you know, my, in my first novel, which took place uh, 1808 to just after the beginning of the War of 1812, um, and I didn't discover this until after it was published, and I just have never gone back and changed it. But uh, in the wedding bed scene, he's undressing her and he takes off her her pantaloons. <laughs> you know, it's like, whoops, that wasn't until afterwards I, I found out, well, that wouldn't be correct because she wouldn't even have been wearing them in the first place. Yeah. So, so. No, pantaloons did come in uh, toward the end of the Regency. They were not commonly adopted. There was a lot of suspicion about them but they, they Wasn't it, it was queen charlotte who actually finally made it fashionable for aristocratic women to wear them but that was toward the end of her reign she yes. was quite a bit i think she was past all those having all those children before she started wearing drawers <laughs> oh that's probably why she started wearing them <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna refrain from the powerless joke but go for it <laughs> well Okay, well, I thank you very much, uh, Annie. This has been very informative, and uh, um, we will be posting the replay probably tomorrow or the next day, and all of the replays of uh, Spotlight on Romance are available on uh, the YouTube channel, which, you know, they let you have handles now, and so my handle is Paula Judith Johnson, so. Oh, great. All right. So I thank you very much. And uh, I, I know that uh, we had more people, um, we always have more people register than show up because of time zones. You know, we have people clear from, from England to Australia. So um, most yeah. people just catch these on the replay, but I thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank it you was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.